In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was so excited to be able to teach on this gospel passage. In fact, I told Father Judd this week, if I could write an icon, if I had that ability, or even if I could commission an icon to be written, this would be the story that I would choose to have written. Because to me, this gospel passage is the epitome of the word gospel, if we consider gospel to mean good news. This passage exemplifies what Jesus meant when he began his ministry by standing up in the synagogue. Remember way back at the beginning of the minist his ministry, he stood up in the synagogue and he quoted Isaiah saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is what Jesus', Jesus mission is all about, and this is what happens in this gospel passage. But now we have to put this gospel passage in context because the evangelist, Mark, has clear purpose in his just juxtaposition of this week's reading with last week's. They form one chapter. Last week, I'll refresh your memory, we, we read about the Pharisees and how they were criticizing Jesus' disciples for not washing their hands. And Jesus rebuked them. And he pointed out that they were putting human tradition and human beliefs above the ways of a loving God. He said, you abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. God commands us to love one another. And they were instead criticizing one another. Jesus teaches them that it's not human traditions that are important, but it's God's expansive love that counts for more. See, they had it backwards. The traditions and the commandments are there to serve and clarify love. It's not the other way around that love is supposed to be confined within our human ideas and traditions. We have to expand our way of thinking to be closer to God. The Pharisees were being closed-minded, and Jesus criticizes that. And then, in Mark's Gospel, the very next story he tells, Jesus sends out, sets out for Gentile territory, that is, non-Jewish territory. Jesus taught us first with words the concept about the expansive nature of God's love, and now he goes to show us what it means in action. He gets out of his comfort zone, and he goes to find out experientially the boundaries of God's love and God's care and God's mission. He goes to Gentile territory, and in going there, he goes to a people who his people believed were separated to God, from God to some extent. You see, the Jews, he believed, were the chosen people. And the other people are not the chosen people. They're a little bit set off. They're kind of second class. And now this is important to Mark to show that Jesus goes to them because in early Christianity, in the time that Mark's writing, people were still were, were arguing about whether the Gentiles should be included in that new way of love that would eventually become called Christianity. And so Mark is applying Jesus' action to his own time to show people, hey, he went to others. Can we do no less? True to his word at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus has been bringing love and wholeness to all the people who are most desperate for love and wholeness. 
And of course, this makes him very popular with the people who have been cut off or alienated from having what they needed to make them whole. So even when he tries to hide or lay low for a while, people find him. The Syrophoenician woman found him. And her daughter had an unclean spirit. And so she goes to Jesus. Now, this woman had three strikes against her. One, she's a woman. Women did not have much standing in those days, and women had no voice, no power to speak in public. Two, she's a Gentile. She's part of that non-Jewish, not chosen race. And three, her daughter had an unclean spirit, which to some extent taints her too. Yet, Jesus talks to her. Now, in our hearing today, we hear Jesus' words as harsh. I mean, he calls her people dogs, her and her people. But he doesn't cut her off. He recognizes her as a person in need and a person who is filled with love for her daughter. And he has the compassion and the open-mindedness to engage in conversation with her. He gives her the opportunity to speak to him. Yes, he gives the opportunity for a woman to speak to the man. And in Matthew's version of the story, this is made more dramatic because in Matthew's version, the disciples are protesting and they tell him, what, send her away. What are you doing even talking to her? But he opens a dialogue. Last week, we read the passage where Jesus challenged the Pharisees' close-mindedness. They were making a God of their own thought tradition rather than being open to the greater call of love. So now Jesus shows us what love looks like in practice. He enters into open dialogue, open-minded dialogue with this woman. He begins by telling her where he stands, and he's open to hearing her response. He tells her, hey, from what I've been told, our people are the children and your pe who, who get fed, and your people are the dogs. What do you think about that? Where are you in this? He's open to being schooled by a woman, a Gentile, someone unclean. Everyone deserves a voice. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We can be taught by anyone. If Jesus is open to being taught by a woman, then how much more must we be listening, listen to one another? We can learn from anyone we encounter. Sick people, homeless people, poor people, disabled people, minority people, LGBTQ plus people, they all have something to teach us. In fact, they're our best teachers because those people who have been alienated or left out in any way are able to show us what we simply don't see because we don't have new eyes anymore. They move us out of our own comfort zone into new understanding. Just as Jesus moved out of Jewish territory into Gentile territory, we must move out of our own group think and challenge our own understandings. Now, if today's reading stopped right there, I would think this is still plenty of good news. But the passage doesn't stop there. The abundance of this passage goes on because it turns out that this woman is very wise. She uses Jesus' analogy of the children and the dogs and turns it on his head. Yes, food is for the children, but in the bun abundance of God, everyone benefits. We all sink or swim together. Barriers disappear. 
she points out to Jesus, if you are who you say you are, love will flow endlessly without bounds. If you, in fact, are the son and embodiment of love itself, then you must recognize me as created by that same creator and participating in the same life that you have. If love is as abundant as you claim it is, then there can be no bounds on that love. It's for everyone, even me and my little daughter. And Jesus recognizes the truth of her teaching. He sees that she, more than most, truly does understand what he's been preaching and what he's been saying and what he's been trying to get across to his own people. And since she and Jesus can now see each other, no longer as alienated person and person who's chosen, but both participating in the same spirit, because she's united in heart with Jesus, her daughter is healed. Miracles happen. And Mark wants the people of his time to participate in that same spirit where there are not boundaries, but a free flow of love and life. They must accept Gentiles as Jesus did. They must accept women as Jesus did. And the gospel still doesn't end there. It goes on. Jesus moves even farther around into Gentile territory. The route makes it circuitous. He goes all the way to the region of the Decapolis, where they bring to him a man who is deaf and mute. And Jesus takes him away from cra the crowd. He's done this before in Mark, where he, has, he removes, it separates from the crowd to focus on what's really important. In fact, he actually literally puts his fingers into the man's ears, blocking out any noise, symbolically blocking out any noise or distractions of voices or stories from the crowd. Let me block your ears. Don't listen to that voice that says that you are not worthy of love. Let me block your ears. Don't listen to those voices who think that the deafness is somehow your fault because you sinned. Let me block your ears against anything that would tell you that you are any less than anyone else. And then Jesus gets, spits on his hand and puts his hand on the tongue of the man, symbolically uniting Jesus and the man. I don't know about you, when I was a kid, especially boys that happened to be, would, do, would uh, spit on their hands and then shake hands and become blood brothers somehow. That was uniting. I didn't do that, but I've seen people do that. <laughs> This is symbolically what Jesus was doing. He was uniting himself to the man. And then looking up to heaven, which is totally open to Jesus. We know that from his ba ba baptism. He looks up to heaven that is open to prayer and oneness and wholeness. And he says, be open." And this man, who had been alienated, who had been closed off from receiving, was able to receive. He became one with Jesus, and in so doing, Jesus' openness and wholeness reached this man's heart and healed him. And it healed him so completely that it also cured him. It opened his ears and his tongue that he can receive the good word and he can speak the good word in his heart. That boundless love flowed into him and healed him through and through. The man is now whole, no longer alienated, able to hear and have a voice in this world. 
And thus Mark reinforces the importance of setting love free from human bounds and preconceptions and groupthink. And then Mark closes with, he has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. He echoes once again Isaiah, part of which we read this morning and in other places. Isaiah's promises about the kingdom of God coming, and Isaiah tells us what it's going to look like. The blind will see, the lame will walk, the deaf will hear. This is the good news of the kingdom of God. Those who have been silenced now have a voice. Those who have been held captive or alienated now take their place in society as equals. Because there's a place, not a literal place, but a place of God's will, a place of God's reign, where God's freedom reigns not human tradition and limiting ideas. There's a place where everyone will be allowed to speak out loud the spirit implanted in their hearts, where abundance is allowed to multi multiply without boundaries. There's a place where there are not outsiders and insiders, but only the beloved. Jesus came to join hearts with each one of us and whisper, Ephpatha, be opened, so that that place, God's place, lives in our hearts as well. May it be on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.